Hey lads. So we just finished recording with Sue. Uh, you know, Taik and I wanted to recap the episode that you guys are about to watch. Obviously, it was a kind of like a rare experience. I think Sue hasn't done any third party, um, you know, podcasts like this in, in a couple of years since since last cycle, really. And, you know, even though there's people that love him, people that hate him, you know, a lot of mistakes were made last cycle that affected a lot of people's balance sheets. And, and obviously, like, you know, it gets quite emotional when, when that's the case. Uh, we thought that there would be, you know, putting aside, you know, any ethical judgments, just a lot of value. And, you know, at Steady Labs, we always have this culture of preferring open communication and neutrality. Um, Take you, how did, how did you feel about the episode? Yeah, I mean, I thought he was pretty open about, I guess, his experience with like jail and whatnot. Um, but for, from my point of view, I was more curious to get his viewpoints on where we are in the market cycle, because I think we're all trying to navigate the markets. Um, and given his experience, I do think it's valuable to at least get his viewpoints. Um, later in the podcast, I did ask him about, you know, like what did he learn just going 100x and then just like li being, being liquidated on that and like blowing up. Um, and I think he showed a lot of humility and no, I, I think overall um, there's a lot to learn from this episode. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to, you know, open communications and give him a platform to give his market views. Um, and yeah, I think the viewers are going to enjoy this one. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're at the point in the cycle where things are really starting to froth up and some of the uh, echo the echoes of last cycle are starting to appear. Um, there are obviously like massive mistakes, a lot of lessons learned, and we did manage to get through a lot of the um, things that, you know, could be gleaned and, and maybe done better the second time around. And Sue is really like, you know, one of the people that was front row center <laughs> at, at a lot of the stuff that was going on, both on the upside and then the downside. And, um, you know, he told us from the beginning, all questions were on the table. So, um we really had an open discussion and, and we hope you guys enjoy it and find some value in it. Yeah. And one last thing I, I like that is I think near the end, he also talked about some moral hazard in this space where, you know, in, in order for a company in crypto to become big, you know, you kind of have to do certain things um, because that's how you get there. Um, and it's the things that you do to get there that end up, you know, leading to excesses and I guess holes uh, that end up ending cycles. Um, so I think also from a viewer's point of view, it's also important to start thinking about that um, where, yeah, like maybe things are still relatively early, but maybe near the end, a tail end of the cycle, it's, you have to ask yourself, okay, like, you know, who's swimming naked if, you know, if this had runs out. So uh, things like that, I think is very important. No, I, I, I totally agree with that point. At the end, like we have to remember that there's a lot of individual incentives and sometimes they work collectively for the good. You know, we're all kind of in the same boat going the same place and sometimes, you know, people are different parts of the pipeline and, uh, and there can be advers adversarial effects. We've seen those play out many times and they will continue to play out until, you know, the structure changes. So it's good to reflect on them. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy the episode. Welcome to Steadily Ads, everybody. I'm Jordi, CIO of Selene Capital. As usual, we have with us Taiki, the humble farmer and full-time researcher at HFA. We have Justin, the CEO of Astaria. We have Thicky. Uh, I'm seeing double. We have two Thickies. Uh, okay, looks like we have a very special guest. So we're very excited today. Uh, Suzu is here. Uh, I think this is, is this your first third-party podcast, I think. Uh, since yes, for sure, it's been a while. Yes, um, yeah, two years almost. Yeah, you know, we're in this like part of the cycle right now where things have obviously been heating up. There is like all kinds of random stuff popping off. I'm getting vibes of you know 2020, 2021, and uh, you know, I think you're one of the few people that really knows and understands the psychology of of the markets in, in this kind of time. You know, I I feel like I'm a bit too like normy to to like understand some of the things that that i'm like witnessing every day so we wanted to bring you on give our audience a chance to kind of like you know dive into the mind of someone that you know has really kind of ridden the waves here so i guess like first question is like is this is this like that sort of part of the bull market are, are we getting into 
the craziness or how are you seeing it? Yeah, I think actually it's still very early in the cycle because we're pre-having. I think true retail is not here yet, right? If you look at metrics, if you look at the man on the street, he's not he's not coming in and buying coins really. I think that, so from that point of view, it's almost like late 2019, early 2020, but without the COVID macro. Uh, I think that's almost the way to think about it because stuff was already doing well. Stuff was getting heated. I mean, funding was really high in, in early 2020, uh, for instance, as well. I think that just that because it's a new cycle, crypto is so much bigger that it it just all feels ubiquitous all the time now anyway. But but I think if you look at some other similarities, it's like, you know, Bitcoin's really strong. You've got the ETF inflows, which is a little bit like the Grayscale inflows. Uh, so I think it's a really nice time for natives to start positioning themselves for the big moves. I think it's like definitely the, the, the huge moves are ahead of us because, you know, you, you don't really have that big liquidity distribution time frames yet. Right. You don't, you know, stuff is up, but then, you know, can people really, uh, take it to the next level? You know, not necessarily yet. So, yeah, I mean, on the retail side, it does look like, yeah, you know, Coinbase application rankings are, are kind of agreeing with you, like we're not quite there on uh, on retail side. So it seems to be that, you know, the the Forex moves that we've had in, in like the big coins are mainly driven by institutional flows or are, are we to believe that kind of big guys are coming in? Yeah, I think it's a combo of uh, like a reversion to the mean, right? If you take out the big dumps of 2022, you know, the the June dump of 2022 and then the, and then the November dump, you know, it's almost like a reversion back to fair value. I feel the the current ranges that markets are in. It's the kind of the, you know, the the high forty, low fifty range is a is a is a actually a natural range for Bitcoin to sit in. I think I uh, I think Ether as well. You know, three K is a really natural number for it to sit in, sort of pre having pre Bit Catalyst type stuff. So I think the the amount of supply on exchanges is very low, especially on Ether right now. So that that's also a big contributing factor. Like. You know, a coin with very low circ supply, you don't even need that much new money to come in. You just need the existing community to all restake and hold hands, right? And then uh, it can go up just from that. So I think a lot of that has been happening. That's why you see funding high. It's a little bit scary on one hand, but on the other hand, I think it's like, it's, you know, sometimes the leverage guys win, right? They don't always lose. If they always lose, then then the whole thing wouldn't work. So I think here's a period where they've been winning. And I, and I actually think they will generally keep winning. You mentioned now is the time for crypto native to natives to reposition themselves. Are you fully allocated at this point? Have you been fully allocated, or are you still building that position? I think uh, a, a, like a hypothetical portfolio that I would have would definitely be fully allocated. I think that you want to be long ether over Bitcoin at these levels for sure. I think that O five is is an immortal bottom in general, just because of. Um, a lot of dynamics, really, but mainly just because ETH is more is still more deflationary. So even if Bitcoin flows are coming, it just doesn't matter that much because ETH people will be like, if Bitcoin goes up, then I don't sell my ETH. I wait for a higher price. So I think that 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 structure really bullish. At the same time, you get cycling out. So I so I think around 05 levels, you want to be much more overweight to ETH and Bitcoin. I think that L1 is more tricky now because you have seen a 10x on Solana now and. You know, there's, I think the the downtime on Solana actually did take people a bit by surprise. I think that, you know, that plus you, you can't really do a lot of the DeFi stuff that you can do on EVM still on Solana. Like as, as great as it is, you can't do a lot of things. Yeah, it's not safe for a lot of the things that you can use Ethereum for, right? So I think that there is kind of a return to uh, normalcy. I mean, I think uh, everyone in the audience is going to be curious, like your thoughts on, on the ETH sort of versus Alt L1. You know, infamously, you, you had said that you're abandoning ETH and then you kind of like, you know, rebalanced it. You're like, okay, actually, I'm not going to just let you guys, you know, <laughs> watch the burn. At this point, like, you know, there's new L1s as well. It's a legendary pasta. Like, I, sometimes I, I just see it like on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I remember when this came out. And I like took this as gospel and it re I had to reevaluate my whole thesis around ETH. It was, this was crazy. So you really messed with my mind here. <laughs> I remember that day it came out. I was, I was short AVAX and I just got ripped a new one. I mean, it was so <laughs> painful. This is still kind of true though, right? The, like still on ETH mainnet, you can't really do much other than restake ETH. It's kind of played out. You can't, you can't do anything on ETH mainnet than, than restaking. I think that it's only going to get worse, actually, because I think that there, there, there's no need for a plan. It's same as Bitcoin L1. Bitcoin L1, you're also not going to be able to do much soon, eventually, but it won't matter because 
when the market caps are so big and then store of value, people don't really want to upgrade the L1 all the time and like risk things. So I think uh, it's just going to be very expensive. And, you know, I do think we're going to see a big ETH NFT revival though, because the expensiveness of the chain actually creates more value for the NFTs and the culture on it. Cause you're just doing expensive as hell shit all the time. Right. It's like, you think about the, the NFT cycles in 2021, it's like, wow, we just burned 10 million gas together. Like we just burned like, you know, we're, we're all burning our money together. That's awesome. Like, so, so there's a kind of, there's already that, that element. You actually can't compete with that as a low key chain. Like if you're, if you're a say or something, or if you're like some, some chains really fast, like what, the, there's no costliness. There's no proof of work to the culture. Of it. So I think that's the biggest strength of Ethereum and, and Bitcoin have, which is that, you know, people mainly hold and then they do really costly things to ball out and, and show up. So, you know, that that's good for NFT. Proof of paycheck, basically. You know, you have to yeah. <laughs> you have to burn it to to make it matter. Um, I mean, some people would agree. I, I've been recently looking at the ape chain stuff, though, where like, you know, ape holders are still remembering how much gas they burnt on that day that, you know, they just like burnt infinite gas, I think, on, on the, the ape launch. So they're not too pleased about their like, post gas uh money that they got out um i mean Fiki, you you kind of look a lot about catalyst and i i remember in 22 it was all about like tradfi like following equities and like cpi was coming out what a huge deal as, as an hft firm now we, we barely like look at the tradfi like releases anymore it doesn't seem to matter does that mean that we're less institutional more institutional i mean you're looking at the etf flows what what do you think is like actually relevant right now is it retail moving price is it like is it like you know macro it doesn't seem to be macro anymore i think we're past that in, in my perspective like we definitely saw like huge inflows into etfs which is kind of unexpected for my part after like equities broke all-time highs and like the question remains right now like is this like long-term like sticky allocator capital coming into it or is this more like speculative like gme retail tradfi traders like coming into bitcoin Today's actually like an interesting like day to look at if there's an inflection point because today's actually the first day there's negative net flows into these ETFs. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see like whether we see outflows on like IBIT or FPC or if we just keep getting like you know constant steady allocations. He said it and then he dropped off. He just like dropped the mic. You know we got a little like a little picky picky moment there. I mean, so my feeling is reading the market that. There's a lot of gambling going on in like some of these coins that don't make sense. Like these these valuations are clearly like wrong, uh, and like in in terms of like a long term, you know, fundamental perspective. And given what you said that there is not that much retail, like new retail, like the the mom and pop kind of shop people haven't come back. Does that just mean that the degens have like more money to gamble with, or, or you know, they got their FTX checks back? You know, like they they sold for. 60 70 80 cents and now they're just putting it back in like what's actually happening there's always going to be coins that don't make sense from a fundamental perspective and that's kind of what i meant today with the price leads narrative stuff where at a high enough price people will come up with a new narrative for it and then you're like ah so that's why it's worth so much the coins that are looking overvalued they don't really matter because you, you never know the true circ you never know the true game that's being played like F ftv is a meme is a concept in the bull market because of the fact that like there is a there's an interesting bifurcation that market makers can do by launching at a high FTV, which is that they don't let anyone buy who cares about FTV. We we talk about it quite often, like the the FTV versus market cap. I know Fiki always like you know thinks about this positions himself on on the low market cap high FTV coins because something like Worldcoin is probably like the the most effed up example in my opinion where. This thing is trading at like higher than OpenAI, right? Like it's a like you know eighty six billion today or something, and at the same time the market cap is something that like the Dijans can easily like you know two x if they want to. Sure, but you know Sama himself owns a very high percentage of the coin. You know the investor base is diamond hand, and they know the and they know the playbook, right? So I think that um, you know where it becomes like a that kind of a coin, and where it becomes more like a definity, where it's just like high FTV like lock everyone and then nuke it possibly the difference between let's say uh like a starkware and a world coin but i think that generally big projects now they have an understanding of what their plan is so i think that it's just executing the plan it's become more efficient i feel it's become more trad ish in that like they know how it's going to trade the market makers are more conservative so i think that 
that that's why you generally see conservative price action, but it's like kind of logical ish. And then, you know, I mean, that's my feeling from having seen it. I think you see this, especially with, with launch pads, right? Where launch pads, they're not really good for the 10 X on launch anymore. They're more just like, okay, here's almost the exit event. And then after the exit event, you then wait and you buy it or something. Right. So, so I think the dynamics there are, are, are evolving a lot. I, I think that it's valuation is, is not, we're, we're not in the part of the cycle where the FTV is a, is the reason why you can sell it. It's going to be something else, I think. I have a question, um, Justin, if you can pull up my screen here. So you had this tweet around, you know, we're still, I guess, early in the bull cycle. Um, and this isn't really a time you want to sell. It's a time to accumulate um, and combine farming with trading, optimize that 3D portfolio, get agile market beta, and also going against the current uh, market at key pivots. Uh, can you kind of go over what you mean by this? Uh, and what do you mean by a 3D portfolio? I think 3D means that, and and Soros talks about this in his books as well, but basically uh, you want to have like a base layer, of, let's say your your core positions that are, you know, going up, denominated into whether that's Ether or Bitcoin. And then you also want to have ways you're then using that capital. So whether it's, you know, you can borrow some against it and then farm with it or whether you can replicate it in perps and then get dollars. Like one of the things you can do is you can always see at any given time, can you farm more from coins like Ether and Bitcoin or from stables, right? Because that varies depending on the regime. Like one of the things we did really well on was like, you know, there was a period where compound farming, right when it launched, it's about 200% APY on huge size uh, from the double-sided farming of DAI. And, and, you know, and, and so we were really big in that. To the point that Robert, I think he messaged us and was like, can you please stop, uh, you know, or at least not sell it if you farm this. And we're like, okay, then we just won't sell it or something like that. I can't remember what we said, but he couldn't do anything about it because it was just, it's, that's the power of DeFi, right? But, um, you know, the double-sided farming, I think, got the TVL up to $2 billion, So he can't complain either. It ended up going, the coin went up a lot. Yeah, so so basically, so what we did, but we wanted to keep a long exposure. So we long ETH calls, we long ETH perps, long ETH futures. So you keep the exposure while you farm with stables, that's kind of 3D, right? Because it's like, you need to combine derivatives in DeFi and, and, and CFI a bit. I think like always look, look for spots or like, where can you get, like given that you want to be long X amount of coins, how do you create that exposure with the most alpha, right? So that right now it can be, you know, Pendle type plays if you like some of those, or it can be like, you know, you can just go raw restaking if you like those. But I think it's an interesting time. I mean, there's, also Blast, right? Which I think actually will 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 probably do really well. I, I think they've been really impressive. Uh, the 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 Blast dev airdrop, especially, I think it will create a good ecosystem. They want to sync, right? Like people love having a sync. I, I I feel like this is a human need just for like closure. Like, okay, I got my coin. Where do I stake it? I, I'm you know I saw this guy like talk, I'm not gonna like uh, name names, but I'm in some Telegram group and and, and this dude is like Tradfi guy. He's like. Where do, where do I stake my Ondo? I got my Ondo token, but I don't know where to stake it. How do I get my yield? And it's like, there's there's no state. Like, what do you think staking is? Like, there's one, they want to put it somewhere and then feel like, you know, it's in the fridge, right? Like, it's 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 somewhere and it makes sense. Yeah, I did my job and like I, I put it in the, in the safe or something. If, if I can chime in, like earlier, Sue, so you said that, you know, the markets are more efficient. You have to be sharper. Um, and then maybe there's less edge trading centralized exchange coins. Um, and I think a lot of our audience, you know, we're playing the liquid markets. Um, what do you think, you know, like what types of sectors and verticals do you think will be, you know, obvious in a few years, but looks dumb right now? AI and crypto is one that's uh, definitely in that category. I think that the the problem with Web2 and AI is, is that Web2 companies are, you know, doxed in a certain way. They're beholden to a lot of interest. And so there's going to be a huge uh, explosion of activity that's that's uh, AI, but doesn't have to, you know, to, you know, have to report to somebody. Right. And I think that that that, uh, you know, we're starting to see that now. I think also just the sheer uh, ability of AI to mobilize lots of uh, people and lots of data. I mean, when we invested in a world coin, uh, it was controversial at the time. I don't you guys remember the the whole meta then, but Worldcoin was it was gonna scan your eyeballs, right? And then people all said, Well, this is against uh crypto ethos because your eyeballs are holy. 
never mind that you you know use your face to unlock your phone every day but uh that was the ethos and then they also said well how's he going to store the data right and what we've seen now is that actually it's all about money it's all about what how much can you make from your data how much can you make from your identity uh so there's projects that are like you know proof of gamer proof of human proof of this proof of that i think that stuff in this range uh, I think Stepin actually showed the power of cryptonomics, crypto tokenomics to mobilize lots of people really quickly. I think we're going to see stuff like that a lot of the cycle because crypto has been normalized very heavily now in society. I think that, you know, even governments that don't have programs where it's like, I give you a token if you work out, I give you this if you work out. So the idea of like doing something to earn and then we add an AI component to it as well, I think it's going to be, um, you know, pretty big stuff that happens there. It's also... But the nice thing there is that I think the ambition level of teams is getting higher, right? You think about product the world coin, that couldn't have happened five years ago because there's no infra. Now, you know, the the infra is there. And moreover, the societal acceptance is there that of course if I scan my eyeball, you're gonna give me money. Like that that that's just natural. How much are you gonna give me? Justin did it. How much did you get, Justin? Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to claim, Sue. So if you know how, let, let me know. I think <laughs> I, I've tried a VPN. I've tried tunneling into someone's home network in Canada. Yeah. I, I just can't get access. Yeah. I remember when I heard about WorldCoin, I was so bullish that I, I sent it to everyone I knew. And they're all like, this is against the crypto ethos, man. Like, you can't scam people's eye, eyeballs. And then and then they had this idea of that time about the orb runners where people will like, they thought you will you will buy the you will buy the orb right, and then you will scan the eyeballs, and you earn like a split. So then, you know, it's kind of like a it's a bit like a step in model actually there too, because you have to buy it, and then you're like lo- locked into it. And they ended up doing a bit of a li- uh, different model, but I just thought that people you know people want UBI, people want something for free. There is very little uh, that you can say to a person about the value of his data uh, that he won't be able to sell to you for ten dollars. Right. I mean, I think the OnlyFans generation proves this really well, where people are like, you know, people are selling nudes for literally like tens of dollars in, in many cases. Right. So I think I think that um, it, in that sense, Worldcoin is actually more democratic and, and more egalitarian. Also, there's the thinking in crypto, like th- this facial recognition data is not already out there. Right. Like to your point, we use our iPhone boarding with planes. You can do it with facial recognition now when you enter via global entry or immigrate back to the US they scan you so it's sort of silly exactly exactly and so now that there's that acceptance and that that AI itself is in that acceptance wave where it's like okay if I'm going to get cool stuff because we're all using AI now then sign me up just make sure I'm, I'm early so I get the most airdrops I can but that's the mentality now so that opens up a huge playing ground for projects where before you know it was more, it was more Ted Kaczynski-ish. It was more like, I don't, because there was a way where people were like, how do I get people off my, you know, how do I get big companies off my phone? How do I get, you know, this kind of stuff? And and that's just, in my view, I think it's been fully rejected because people, uh, each generation gets more and more internet native. They're not used to times where they've ever had any privacy. They're not used to times where they've ever had any, you know, not always online. So it's impossible to 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 take it back, I think. Let me ask you this. Um, you've mentioned the word cycle a, a lot on this show so far in the last half hour. Uh, what are your thoughts on cycle theory? I mean, do you believe in cycles? Is it because of the having? Is it something else going on? Where does macro play a role? Cycles definitely uh, exist. I think part of it is that projects get really overheated. Uh, and then expectations and reality that there's a gap. Once there's that gap is too large, I think that there needs to be a reset typically. Um, I think that the levels of reset are usually higher and higher on good coins. And then for ones with bad teams, then they'll just use that as an excuse to not work anymore, right? So, so that's why uh, up to now, the only coin to have ever outperformed Bitcoin across two cycles is Dogecoin. Uh, there's no other coin out of like 30,000 coins that has ever outperformed its previous high versus Bitcoin. Uh, it's actually shocking to think about. It's actually shocking to think about when you really think about it. I mean, some people think Ether, but then you think about e- but like Ether, it actually hit you know, 0.13 at some point in like May 2017 off, you know, Ethereum Alliance and Bitcoin scaling war stuff. So, you know, the, the next cycle, it only hit 0.089 or something, right? So by that logic, you, you need to sell your BDC at 07 because, you know, it may not it may not make a higher high versus the previous cycle uh, from that point of view. Uh, as scary as that may sound to, to ETH bulls. Is, th- is that what you believe? 
I'm reserving judgment on it. I, I think I, I need to see how it develops. I think that ETH BDC is in an e eternal range, 0.05 to 0.075. So I think 0.07, you'll see a lot of whales sell. Uh, so then it's a question of, is there enough fundamentals to push it through? Not. I think that 0.05, they buy. It's just free money for, for them. You see it on Bitfinex all, all the time. They're just like, okay, it's 0.05. They just click it, and then they buy everyone's ETH versus Bitcoin. And then at 0.07, okay, I press the button, I sell it to, back to you. You know, so so it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's like Lundar's tweet said that as well, right? It's like 0.69 is the fair value. We're just going to bounce back and forth around it. Those are kind of the good lessons to learn from each cycle, I think. Um, and that's why market wants new, new coins. It wants new narratives, it, stuff where they don't know where the back holders are and they don't have to care, right? So, Like one thing that surprised me is that, I mean, this cycle looks a lot similar to last cycle where you know, people can't use ETH mainnet, so they just go to Alto ones and they just bid the native token. Uh, do you think that like this, what do you think this cycle looks like if you think that we're in the early stages of a bull market? Are, are, are we just going to pump all the Alto ones? Uh, maybe some AI coins? I think multi EVM stuff. I think Arbitrum, Optimism. I mean, Arbitrum is kind of one for a lot of DeFi perp stuff. I think that Optimism has its own stuff. Uh, base. I think that EVM, n honestly, not much of the value is going to be captured by ETH from like multi EVM type activity. ETH is just the new Bitcoin, basically, right? It's like ETH and Bitcoin are both Bitcoin. So the OGs swap between them interchangeably. It doesn't matter. It's the same. So that that's the way that I think that the market trades very much so, especially because they're, they're going to be both the coins with ETFs, right? So it's going to be a little bit like, you know, uh, Coke and Pepsi type thing, especially because now Bitcoin has ordinals as well. So it's really very, very similar. If you really zo zoom out, you got L2 activity, you've got, you know, ordinals, and then, and then you've got holders who like to hold mainly, and then, you know, jerk off to the burn in the ETH case. And then in the Bitcoin case, they jerk off to the supply that's locked. They jerk off to the halving. So there's a lot of holding while jerking off, right? In, in, in both <laughs> for sure. Um, which is good, by the way. It's good. It's bullish. A few episode, uh, episodes ago, Sue, uh, Jordy said that he thinks um, ETH BTC could hit all-time highs or at least appreciate like substantially this year, partially due to the ETF and then just the lack of supply of ETH on exchanges. You mentioned the fair value is probably like 0.07 and will range somewhere around 05, 07, 08. Do you think what Jordy's saying is in the cards for like a temporary bubble or do you think ETH BTC is, it's sort of over all of the edge with ETH is, is gone? I, I think if you asked me at a different time, I would have said it's more possible. But now I think there is a lot of competition and new users generally go to uh, Solana or they go to other chains. So... I think that the value accrual back, I mean, I think in general, ETH is burning a lot less than people thought it would burn, right? I think if I looked at, I mean, Bankless is a bit ETH hard, but uh, I think their their estimate, I, I think we're about at 10% of that estimate. I think that it's not inflationary, but it's not deflationary. It's like a fixed supply coin, I think is what it is. So the net, so the narrative on that is not like, we're going to burn all the ETH. You got to hold the final ETH and the final ETH is worth infinite kind of thing. I think we're, we're much more in like, you know, we're roughly going to burn what we emit, weakens the narrative a bit. I do think that because the mainstream still views ETH as smart contract platform, and then when they try to use it, they're like, I'm not going to use that, I'm going to use something else. That that does naturally hurt its prestige. Also, I think that ETH people cannot go to Bitcoin and say, no, like, how are you going to solve fees, right? Because remember, that was a huge part of the ETH uh, narrative, which is that Bitcoin is going to not be able to have any fees on it. And now it's like ridiculous amount of fees on it, actually from, from uh, BRC20 activity. So that's another, you know, kind of card that they don't get to play in the mainstream media by saying, you know, bi you know Bitcoin has this problem. So, so I think the fudding of Bitcoin is kind of gone right now, right? You don't get the POW FUD as you used to do either because I think, you know, people just, it's kind of moved on from, from that, you know, ESG has kind of hit its, you know, top as well. So I think uh, Bitcoin's really strong basically. So, so you're not going to get that Bitcoin to Ether rotation that you used to get. You might not get a rotation, but you could just get like fresh, like ETH money without Bitcoin. Like it doesn't have to be crypto native. It could just be like. You could, you need Larry Fink to really hit the bottom part of the thing. Yeah. He, where, where he's like, you know, I have Bitcoin and Ether ETF, but I'm um, like, you got to sell your Bitcoin for Ether because I, I do think it does have to be, it does have to be a rhetoric of negation because 
if it's purely, you know, ETH is great, but Bitcoin is also great, then they'll be like, okay, so what are the market caps? I'm going to buy the market cap weighted. Thank you. You know, and it's never going to pump from that. So, so you need the, you need there to be like, and that's what Solana did really well, right? Which is like, uh, it's obviously very toxic, Solana manly type culture at that time, but it's, it's still, it's still, it, it does work for, it does work because people are like, shit, like I'm owning the wrong smart contract platform. I got to own the right one. I'm owning BlackBerry. Right. That's why at that time some money got so much shit because you always would make the Blackberry now. He's like, eat this Blackberry. And yeah. you know, uh, if you own Blackberry, you're screwed now. So. Let's talk about Dogecoin a little bit because we mentioned it briefly. And that's something that, you know, I remember we've, we've had like, you know, famous debates about Dogecoin. Um, is, you know, I've always been the, the Dogecoin bear, I guess. Um, it hasn't done anything this cycle. It's like the, you know, the meme with like the guy like poking with a stick, like, come on, do something. It's it's like not done anything. Um, is the only way it does something. It's like, is it an Elon coin now? And it just needs Elon to like really get involved or. Yeah. I think actually Elon. Yeah. I mean, I, I talked to some guys in the Doge community about this a bit and they actually think like Elon almost got too involved. So it became Elon. Cause the problem with that too, that too high of an involvement is that then when he stops, then he like, well, then it's dead. Cause Elon hasn't done anything. Right. So. So I think that that's been a problem for Doge um, because he's he's such a high profile figure that he kind of it's kind of made that his identity. I remember you, I remember like you were you were kind of like expecting more from Doge. Do you, at this point, have you kind of abandoned Doge or like <laughs> or are you not abandoning Doge? I think that Shiba Inu, um, Shiba Inu did very very well a cycle off like you know they essentially they had a stealth phase of like DeFi farming bone kind of stuff and then uh, I was actually shilled Shiba you know at like a really really low market cap and I didn't buy it. Uh, it it would have been like a like a billion dollar trade from the guy who showed it to me but uh, I watched it for a bit then and then I just thought there could never be another dog coin because like you know you only need one dog coin and then you just come up with like infinite dog coins so I do think that does hurt Doge prestige because now people are like you know, there's not, in fact, just one Dogecoin. And then I'm like, of course not, because Bitcoin thought the same thing and then they were wrong. Everyone's always, ETH people thought the same thing and they're also wrong. You're, they're always wrong because you can always make a new coin, right? That that's the power of human ingenuity. Um, and it's a rentier society mentality as well. It's like, let's say you buy the first dog coin and you're like, this will be the only dog coin that ever exists. Everyone that likes dogs will have to pay rent to me. They will buy my dogs, <laughs> right? And then that becomes very natural to think and then you just look around and be like no i'm gonna buy a lower price one i remember there's a guy who had a spreadsheet of all the dog coins that he bought during like the beginning of dog coin uh like there was a dog coin wave right and he's like this one ran away the, the, uh, meaning it rug this one ran away this one up 100x this one up 100x okay this one up 30 but it's just hilarious i'm vsc on like different chains I'm not, but I Sue's comment on Doge is the only coin to put in new highs against BTC two cycles running is very fascinating. I don't own any Doge now. Maybe I should after hearing that. But Sue, I on a similar note to Doge, because I think they're sort of the one in the same Cardano. What are your thoughts there? Same as, as Doge, basically. I mean, I guess Cardano probably hasn't put in another high against BTC. Cardano, I think, didn't reach a high versus previous cycle, but it got close-ish, actually. It was one of the closest ones. Um, but I do feel that Cardano, I mean, it's kind of been a long time. I mean, we've been told about these peer reviews and these DeFi projects for a long time and they're not really here. Yeah. So I just don't know if, uh, it's just too late. I think, I mean, if you look at EOS, right, they, they almost like front ran it cause they were like, you know, we could try to build it, but let's just, let's just not. And then, and then, so there's no point building it is bearish. Yeah. So that's what I think Cardano's in. So I think it's going to be harder to get that narrative because there were people who bought it thinking that they were going to actually build it. Talk about like getting money and not building. And another one that we used to talk about was the NFT situation because back then it was very new and you have this situation where you, you get all the money up front and just for a picture, you know, and then like some people are like, okay, like why should I work now? Like I've already been paid. I mean, some people have managed to build it out. Like Pudgies, I guess is the one. Um, Ether Rocks, which is like the the least effort stuff, still is like doing really well. I think like GCR is like super bullish on on the rocks. At at this point, like the whole NFT phase, like is is there like a proof of work that is there, or is it just uh you know is it like a meme coin? I mean, if you look at ETH NFT grill culture, it's actually doing decent. Right? I think Autoglyphs, a bunch just sold for like twelve million. 
Uh, I think that, um, you know, punks have reclaimed the number one, you know, it's, it's low hype, but it's also, it's sort of value-ish. I think, I think that NFTs, yeah, the, the, it's like the debate between utility and like community versus like, just it's like cool and rich people on chain own it. I think that that's the, I mean, ether rocks are bullish because rich people own them. And then they are going to be like, this is the thing that rich people own. It's a shelling point. Right. I mean, the old stuff, I guess we, we kind of agree. Like, yeah, the old stuff is like museum relics, right? Like it has this like interesting societal value. But like, imagine a new NFT collection would come out. What would it take for that to like succeed? Like if, it, you know, 2024, someone's launching an NFT collection. That's a really tough question, honestly, because I mean, I haven't been that impressed with the new NFTs that have come out, you know, I haven't followed that closely, but you know, there's like Nakamigos, there was a few others that I looked at a bit. I mean, I actually still like Romilio and Milady a lot. I think that if you look at it, you know, you're not depending on the founder to pump it. You're not depending on a team to pump it. That's always bullish in my opinion for NFTs because if you were depending on that, they, people now remember that it doesn't always work and the team could just keep the money, right? Like I think the Azuki Elemental launch was kind of that big jolt in people's uh, you know, psyche where they were like, wait, they just sold me the same picture again. Um, so, 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 you know, but, but I still, still think Azuki is a great community actually, but, but I just think that maybe people still use those, uh, PFPs, but I do think that there is actually a fatigue with the fact that the team can make more content sometimes. Right. And you said in the tra traditional art world too, where art appreciates after the artist dies. Uh, so Milady, I actually think, you know, it's the only NFT that, Elon's ever tweeted. Uh, and, you know, Romilio's, I feel like, are going to take over CT because they're just the funniest. So I think that, I think that culture is really important. You know, you, you and you can't fake cult, culture. I think Bored Apes, you know, even though they did like stuff where they give celebrities in the beginning, they had good culture, you know, you, they, they had a good thing. But NFT always has the problem was that it starts with good culture and like good, good vibes. And then at the top, it becomes cringe from the fact that it's so expensive. So, so like I have a more personal question, I guess. Um, and of course, in the last cycle, you ran up your fund 100x, 1000x. Um, and then, you know, there's the infamous 3AC candle um, in June 2022. Uh, and now, you know, you're, you're back, you're trying to, you know, run it back again. Like, what were some life lessons learned from, I guess, that entire, the past couple of years? Um, and, you know, like, can you share some wisdom on like how you, know, you plan to handle things better this time? The, the most important is like, remember what got you there and make sure you keep doing the things that got you there as opposed to the, the story about yourself that you uh, hear other people tell. Because I, I think that that's at its core one of the one of the issues, which is that, you know, we were very good at meeting people, synthesizing information, learning from others. You have to always stay hungry and always keep learning. I think, keep, you know, that, that energy is really important. I think also like, I think both SBF and myself, we, we had this mentality because we never failed much before. Like we, we both started companies very young and just everything you touch makes money. Uh, you don't think as much about like failure. And I, and I remember this one time I was talking to CZ and he was like saying, you know, so I've had five companies fail before I started Binance. Like, you know, it's not that easy for most people to just like, like press button and then make money. Right. Uh, Cause he, he, I think he was trying to nudge me at that time saying you're a little bit out of touch. Like normal people actually can't just press touch everything and, and make money. So I, so I think like being, you know, understanding that like making money actually is hard uh, for a lot of people. And also that when you are lucky, you recognize that when you have been lucky, right? And, and also when you are good, you recognize why you were good, not not just this and not just that. So I think knowing yourself really well, being really self-aware is super important, I think. Um, I think also just like from a, like a karma perspective too, like being really good to people who are good to you uh, you know, that, that, you know, what I've seen last year is like everyone that I was really good to, like, you know, during that period, they were good to me at like after. And it was something where like, I actually wish I had been good to even more people. You know, there were times when we were like randomly very generous, but there were times when we were a bit more like, you know, sharkish, we, you know, crowd out the round, get the best allocation, you know, do all this kind of stuff. And, and I think that at the time it feels really wise, but then afterward, you know, and you can do it because you're a big shot. Right. But you know, when we think about it, when I think about it now, it's like, you know, there was, there was definitely a more wise way to do some of those deals. There was more wise way to do some of those things. So I think, I think that this time, like definitely more mellow, definitely not trying to uh, do like a 3AC 2.0 per se, 
because uh, I think that also the market is different as well. And let me ask you this, Sue. Um, it got to a point where, and it might even still be the case, but you could tweet out something and it would move our our small markets, right? What what does that do to your psyche? I mean, we have new people coming up in the space that have that same phenomenon around them. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, where you're sort of controlling your own destiny and you can control the market? The main character. Yeah. I think there's, yeah, there there's two broad advice I would give. I think one is that when you become the main character, you're going to get a lot more pressure and a lot more hate, regardless of what you do, actually. And one of the reasons for that is just because you're the main character. So people who are bored, they can only, you know, you're, you're the center topic. Uh, and so what I've actually realized is that like my perception of hate is very different than what other people might realize. Because like in late 2021, early 2022, like like you would assume it's universal love, but it's not actually. Like everyone was mad all the time for like us dumping on them. Like we like that was the universal three arrows meme. It was like three arrows dumps on followers, it's dumping, it's dumping. And so so I do think that like um if you try to please everyone as the main character, it's not gonna be possible. And one of the reasons for that on a more deep level is the level of inequality in society that we have today, right? Like, I think in the US now, the top 1% has now more money than the bottom 50%. You know, with those trends, basically, if you're going to be a main character, you're just going to have to take the heat that comes with that. There's no other way around it, right? Like, every decision you make is going to get scrutinized. I think that, um, I think that, uh, with that said, you know, it's the true wisdom is like, just if you think like top is in, or you think that you know, there's no way to solve that problem. You just eject. I think that that's what Tijan D- Spartan and GCR learned really well because they realized that you actually, you can't, the only way to win is not play. Actually. Yeah. And that, no, let me ask you this. I mean, this is a simple question. It may sound silly, but I think it's important. It's like, why are you not retired right now? Why didn't you leave crypto? What, what, what caused you to keep building in this space? Why are you still here? Um, I think I realized that um, I really like the space. I also like the challenge. I think that Crypto is uh, super interesting, and I and I also think that there's like when when the ox when the flex stuff first came out, like the way that story kind of came about is like I was hanging out with Mark Lamb in Dubai a bit, and his company had blown up. Basically, it had had, had gone insolvent because a trader on the platform had a manual margin agreement that you know when it came to collect it, the margin wasn't there, the market gap through on. On Bitcoin Cash, on Ether, and so, and so he had that platform, and then it was right after FTX collapsed, and then be, before that, I was more thinking, you know, just like retire, but but then after FTX collapsed, and I talked to Mark, you know, then we said, why don't we, uh, you know, why don't we think about how we can reboot, uh, you know, something here? So and then we had the uh, the the GTX deck leak, right, uh, which was. Um, which was, I think, early Jan. And then Mark put out a tweet where it's like, you know, any new platform will you still use the Flex token. And then I just saw like people paying us being like, wait, how do I buy this Flex token? And Coinflex is insolvent. So people were like depositing money to an insolvent exchange to buy the coin. And like, it was just like, I think the coin went from like one to two cents to like 50 cents and then to a dollar and then three dollars. And then I was in a call like, wow, like, you know, even though we thought there's a lot of hate, actually there's like a lot of people who want to like, you know, you know, bet on us again. And I think that was really touching for me, actually, because it was at a time where it's like right after I came back, right? And so, uh, you know, it was a tough journey for, I think, Flex and then Ox holders, because first it went one cent to eight cents, now back to one cent. But I think that, uh, and then there was the prison dump, obviously, as well, to half a cent. Uh, but, uh, you know, like, through that whole experience, I'm like, you know, crypto school, you get to find your friends, you get to find a lot of, uh, like, a lot of fun stories. It's, it's exciting. I think also ideas wise, I I do think that there is a like I have somewhat of a responsibility to share some of my knowledge back because you know there's mainstream media accounts of SPF, there's mainstream media accounts of stuff that happened, and obviously like you know Doquan is going to be a cent, C- CZ you know is not tweeting anymore, SPF is locked up. So I actually think I will write a book one day about crypto, but I think it's still too early because I think it's too um, it's too fresh. I think. Usually these things take two, three years, but I feel like, like, you know, I do fancy myself a bit of a historian. So I want to be able to just be in the space and, and really kind of be able to think about that history 
Is there like any like big Netflix kind of like uh, there was a lot of talk back when Luna was happening that there was going to be some some Netflix documentaries and stuff about it? You know, the problem is that Western uh, media and, you know, more broadly, they need a narrative. They, if they don't know what it is, they have to make it up. So here they're just too confused what the narrative is. You know, they're like, what is the story arc? You think about social network, right? The one based on Zuckerberg, they make him look like a basically like an like an incel. But um Obviously, that's not actually that's not actually who he is, but they just need a story, right? Like they need it because because the IQ the, the, the average IQ is dropped so low that they don't think they can make a movie just about the actual thing. That they have to make it so that you like understand it, right? I mean, a great example of this was when I read Game of Thrones books and then I saw the show. Like there are many characters that the writer says this character is ugly as hell. And then in the show, it's like, this guy is like hot, right? And it's like, because it's like, you wouldn't understand. Side question, by the way, do you think like Zuckerberg is, uh, is he, is he happy to be portrayed as an incel? He's doing like an SPF where he's like, oh, let me, let me get this like crazy hair and do this like yeah. stupid shit. So, so people kind of like, because I, from what I understand, I, I, I have met somebody who claimed that they were like a Zuckerberg sugar baby. And I don't know if it's true, but like, you know, I know Polly is like pretty big in, in San Francisco, but I have a feeling given this guy's like BJJ and stuff, maybe Justin can like back me up here, but the guy who kind of looks like he's like an incel, sometimes he surprises you. Sometimes he's got some stuff up his sleeve. Like he's protecting his brand. That's my theory, right? He knows what sells. He knows what sells the stock, but he's, he's no incel. Let's be real. Zuckerberg's on a great PR arc, I feel, because he's got, you know, he, he he's buffed up a bit. He's got the BJJ stuff. The stock is looking healthier too. Stock is looking great. Yeah. As I say, let me transition. I have questions because I've been curious about this too, about prison. It's something you've been open about. How how many days or, or months did you end up serving, Sue? I served about 60 days. So Okay. So what what do you think? I mean, obviously it's very different. SPF's in American prison. Or he's in jail, I should say, in a notoriously terrible jail. He's looking at 10 years, 20 years, who knows, right? Is this guy just, he's in hell right now? I assume that's just a totally different ball game you can't relate to. I think it's, I think, honestly, it's what he makes of it, right? Because American jail has its advantages too, from what I've heard. I mean, it's got more freedoms in the sense of like, there's more information flow. Uh, whereas Singapore jail is more isolated information. You're kind of just really on the retreat. Um, I think in the US, um, you know, he could write a book. He could, he could start putting out statements like ross albright has a great presence online you know and he's still really popular um you know people can study it in prison too like even in singapore you know people get their law degree they get their bachelor's they, they do stuff they, they can do work inside the prison like the other cool thing is that the um the people who like serve you the food they like help run the yard or whatever they'll all be inmates typically so they'll be like ones where they're longer so that's cool because there's a lot more empathy basically in the system where it's like, you know, inmate to inmate is always going to be nicer than like officer to inmate, right? So actually, in a lot of situations, it's actually like, I mean, I wouldn't call it as like European as like the full like open prison model of like a Sweden, but it's definitely like, you know, they want for small interactions to be like inmate to inmate as opposed to like officer to inmate. So I think in in, in the US too, like I, I saw the interview with SPF and his, uh, or the one with his cellmate and Tiffany Bong, you know, it, it's it's actually roughly similar to my experience. Like, you know, you, you bond with your cellmates, you, you they roughly understand your story, there's a lot of empathy, you learn a lot about people. Um, I think I think he'll be all right. Honestly, I think I think that um, you know, I've known SBF since late twenty eighteen. He he uh has gone through different phases of who he is. He's actually incredibly generous and sometimes incredibly, you know, uh aggressive in others. I think that he I think he will be better for the experience as well, actually. I think that, um, I mean, now that the FTX estate is like whole as well, I do wonder sometimes, you know, is his argument that it was a liquidity crunch actually true, right? Because, you know, FTT, yeah, it's worth zero if you shut down the exchange, but what if you don't shut it down, right? And FTX equity was worth 30 billion, you know, why couldn't you just give equity to token holders? So I, so I do think that, you know, he definitely crossed a ton of lines, but I think just from a, from a like uh, operational perspective, you know, maybe he can work on that after he's been sentenced. And and then, I mean, like you've gone through uh, like you know massive PL swings, and like for me, um, I mean, you you always seem stoic, despite you know 
insane market moves. Um, and I'm sure like you, you were having like nine figure p l swings some of those times. And for me, like, like I, I can, I can stomach, you know, increasingly like more p l swings, but still like once it gets into the millions, you know, I, I, I'm feeling kind of like nauseous, <laughs> like I'm not feeling good. And I kind of try to extrapolate that to, you know, I know it's a lot like a video game at some point, you know, like swinging 50 million, hundred million, 500 million. They, it sort of just feels like surreal because you're not tying it to like, you know, what you can buy. Like at that point, it's just like, it's just numbers. But like comparing that to prison, I feel like I would prefer, like I, I could do like a, a good, like six months in prison instead of like, you know, the feeling I get when I swing, like, you know, a shit ton of PL, it just feels worse. Were you, were you like, okay, like I've been through worse? Definitely true. Definitely true. Like, I think that, like, honestly, once you enter prison, there's no fear, there's no anxiety because your schedule is so clean. Like, you're, you sleep at 9 30, the light goes off, you wake up when the light goes on. Like, it's, it's really, really different. Like, you, you have no information load also. So you're like here outside, if you have a big position on, you're checking the price all day. You're checking the price when you wake up. You check it when you go to the bathroom. You check it in the shower. You know, you check it everywhere. Uh, you're messaging your friends. What's your view now? You're going on trading view. You're putting in, and like, it's nonstop cycling, cycling between apps, right? And the switch time between apps is absurd as well. You're switching every 15 seconds. So you're just in this nonstop cycle. So you would assume that you get really anxious and fearful in prison, but it's the total opposite because there's a reversion to like the natural state of man where, where, where it's just like, you're actually just like, sitting there you notice like your own hands you, you notice like a lot of stuff like the texture of the wall you notice all this and you're like like i don't think i've ever felt as clear-minded as inside and like once you get out actually i'm already back i'm already back in the haze again because you're taking cold showers too which i highly recommend cold showers is incredibly good for the mind uh now i'm back to like warm showers and it's like you know i, I try to do the cold ones like that uh, comfort is better you do that but actually everything you think is a comfort it's because you got used to it. But if you just got the so-called discomfort, it would not feel like a discomfort after like three days. You know, because we're actually literally evolved to live in the jungle. Like, w- like we're evolved to live like, well, to, to sleep on like fig like fig leaves. So there's no actual need for the comfort that you think you need. Like, it's not a real thing. The the distinction here, Sue, like for our American listeners is probably like, I, I assume safety is not, a secu- is not a concern in a Singapore prison. Like it's very much law and order based where, people are getting jumped you're not worried about that it's super safe in singapore prison i think even in the u.s honestly it's quite overblown like i watched the spf uh somebody interviewed he's like you know there's none of that dropping soap stuff that was maybe in the 90s but like you know now we're quite civilized and i actually think that's probably true in the u.s i think it's just because prison media prison movies that they just like the i mean i think it's actually like a it's it's fun and it may be like it may be a playing out of like a story in a story right so uh but if you look at even prison break i mean prison break was reasonably realistic in terms of the, the way that the prison was designed i think they modeled it after a real prison but it's still like you know it's just like an action it's like an action place whereas if you really understand prison you're in the cell a lot of the time like you're just reading so like if ever if anyone ever made a real prison documentary or like a real prison show it just feel like tons of sitting around talking about stuff, reading, you go to the, play some basketball, come back, eat, eat some food. You know what I mean? Like it's a very, very, it's incredibly slow pace. Um, I mean, just to wrap up that chapter, obviously, you know, you guys didn't have, you know, retail money. It's not like, like, you know, FTX type situation. There, there were obviously some creditors, which, um, you know, had holes in their balance sheet. I guess like Luna kind of started that situation where people thought they had certain money that they that they fell were dollars and then ended up that they didn't and that sort of like filtered through to the entire market and, and you know including you guys and then kind of wiped through and you know there's there's stuff getting worked out now so you know FTX is kind of clearing up you know Celsius is, is whatever those things are, are finalizing um, I guess you know the three AC creditors are going to get at least something uh, I don't I don't know I don't think it's going to be like as high as as like some of the other ones are you kind of like looking forward to to that wrapping up obviously like there's still a lot of people that are associating three arrows with like the collapse of the entire market even though it was you know part of <laughs> part of that that whole crash and there's still kind of people that maybe like looked at you specifically as like the super cycle that kind of gave them conviction obviously like everybody should have you know 
made their own opinions and and, and like not just being like okay i'm going to go along because like somebody else said like how do you how, how do you see like the whole you know post blow up not landscape i mean i think from a from a personal perspective it's like um i think our creditors will do pretty well um off the portfolio i mean the derivative is still has 95 percent market share world coin is an iftb i don't know how much they'll get to ultimately realize that at or how long that'll take but you know starkware as well is doing really well so the portfolio is solid it's unfortunate they've sold the penguins already because i think they sold the bottom of penguins and uh because there were actually quite a few penguins in the portfolio i believe, I believe we had almost 100 penguins um so testament to the taste that we had but uh, i mean they infamously like you know they had like the yeah. ftx guys had sui which they they sold, they sold like, it we launch yeah. <laughs> like, yeah you know you know we, we have aptos also had fuel labs not doing i think it's not launched yet as well but you know there's some big techies and some good stuff unfortunately didn't have celestia you know i think the reality is that if you look at even the previous cycle of bankruptcies like they all were a hole in dollars by the end just so because of how forgiving crypto is and how big it gets each next time like gox was like a big deal and then everyone got 20x the dollars back just not as much bitcoin back and then you know bitfinex you know they, they had a situation actually what i realized is that you know there's always like the stories that people tell about things it'll always generally speaking tell you more about themselves than it tells about the things right like the criticism that i do take the most to heart is like i think we should have been more active on trying to find a restructuring um, because I think that, I think we, in a way, you know, and I talked to Arthur Chan a lot about this recently because we've been, um, thinking about, you know, how would a three arrows restructuring look like? And it's just like, you know, it's the brand value of three arrows was so high and we kind of just wrote it off to zero in a way, the way we, you know, the, the, the way we put into liquidation. I think that that was a shame. Uh, and I also think that, you know, if we had that courage to, and that also that wisdom to find it. Because because there were guys at the time who wanted to do restructuring. They want to say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come in, we'll put Lloyd, Lloyd Bank file on the board, and then we'll like do something. We'll renegotiate in terms of creditors. You know, people wanted to 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 do this, and we 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 lacked the energy to to follow through with it. You know, and then our lawyer said, you just just put in liquidation. I think similar thing happened uh, in some other states too. But I think you know, uh, I'm kind of glad I had this experience now because I kind of see life from both sides. Like I see that it's not always just like everything you touch wins, and also you know, you gain more empathy for when, when stuff fails, right? Because in the past, you know, we were a bit more judgmental when p- people failed. We'd be like, huh, like you failed. That sucks for you. You know, like that, but that's like, you know, that, that must mean you, you suck also. So I think I would like to create something that ultimately my creditors can benefit from as well. I think that that, you know, we, there's been such a divide in like the way that creditors behave. I mean, some actually, they immediately invest in the new thing, whatever it is. And they're like, let's, let's double up, right? Let's double down. I think there's others that, you know, um, you know, take a different approach. I think ultimately for the ones that are like, you know, still, still alive and, and, and doing something, I think that there's a general sentiment that yes, like we, we messed up in terms of, you know, having this kind of hole and in, in, in this situation. But I think that they also feel that we paid the price with them now in some sense, because it's not like we made money while they lost money. Right. It's like we, we were in a way we were given a very long leash I mean, looking looking back, obviously, like they're I'm trying to put myself in your situation in, let's say, like you know that Luna sort of period where there's two things going on through my mind. One is, you know, we have a ton of leverage that's available to us based on like brand value, whatever. Where, you know, we can bet five and like lose one type of thing, and like if we make five, then we keep five, and like that's a that's a big kind of like bet that you can make and you can move markets. And if you believe that, you know, markets can hold up, um, you know, obviously the macro environment, was like the one thing that was like falling apart at the time that kind of like changed the dynamic. But given what you had seen up until now from the crypto markets, like you can kind of like, you know, move enough size and, and just, you know, sailor, he just keeps buying. And like the guy's just like making, like making it happen. So that's one thing going on through my mind. And then the other one is like, this is maybe like the more conservative side of me, at least. And, and I wonder, like, you looking back, you, you see it that way as well, where you're like, we have a money printer, which is like our brand value. We're getting in all the deals. They're all clearly like really good valuations. We don't need to take that much risk because like, and you can say that about FTX as well. Like there's a really good business here that like 
doesn't require like the quick kind of acceleration. Yeah. But I think it, in a way it's like, uh, I mean, not to be totally fatalist about it, but I think because we were rewarded so many times for a certain way of, of, of doing things that I think it was just such a fast shift. And I think also like in general, like the, the behavior of let's say Genesis and, and the big lenders was, was such that Luna was such a shock to system. Like we actually always thought we were conservative with Genesis because they always wanted to lend us much more than we actually wanted to take. Like there, there there's a period where we returned all loans to some of the big lenders and they begged us to take it back because they are like, we're going to do an IPO soon. We can't have the loan work strength. So then we were like racking our brains saying, okay, then what do we do with this? Like, can we keep it and do something with it? So I think like if I was more mature, I would have realized that like, yes, these guys have the capital, but it's all open term deposit from, you know, their base. If there was a huge crash or something like a, like a huge black swan, they would also suddenly need everything back. Right. So I think Sailor uh, was smart because he termed it like it's all two year, three year paper type stuff. You know, we, we never had in-house counsel, right? We, well, a lot of these agreements that they were just, you know, you just sign them and then you, you, you do it. So I think, you know, uh, that's one big lesson I think for Khan and I, which is that uh, you should think about all the scenarios with your counterparties before they happen and talk about what what you should do. And then it's a lot cleaner, right? I think, you know, I think DCG, uh, the Genesis for their part, I mean, I think, you know, they grew very fast. Also, originally, if you think about it, the whole business grew because of ourselves and SPF, right? I mean, they, you know, lent us against ETHE and then we did so well, you know, and then they lent against GBTC. They also lent huge amounts against coins that Sam had just made because then then that creates like infinite li- a borrowing demand. Essentially, it's like a neo bank where it's backed by SPF's brand, right? So I think. But surely like the left tail has to go through your mind. Like you have like such a good distribution of outcomes and like, you know, the sort of like fat tail on, on the left is like something that like Talib says, right? Like sometimes it's like people don't, don't consider it. Did you not consider the left tail enough or like, did you, did you sort of like, I think, it, I think it was just, you know, we were behaving the same way that got us there. I think it was just something that, you know, it's, it's, uh, so you, you, you were acting like in the ways that kept working, but the, the sort of like landscape had changed around you. That that's, I think what happened. And then I think also, um, I think that realistically we, I mean, I think there was a coordination problem in the whole market at that time because uh you know celsius was buying ether we were bullish bitcoin and then sam was selling both of them to buy solana and no, you know this was like a thing where I was actually hanging out with this ftx guy the, the other day and he was like saying you know imagine if like celsius three arrows and uh ftx were all buying solana like that, that, that would have been a crazy market. You know, that would have been something where I mean, it goes to $200 while Ether is $2,000. Right. And then, but, 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 you know, it's a lot of things like that, where it's, uh, you don't quite know until like, so March, 2020, a lot of firms actually at that time went, went, uh, you know, bit into a pickle. And then there was a lot of forbearance because people are like, okay, this will only last one month. You know, we went into that p- position very conservatively and we did well. And then I had seen that, you know, there's a lot of forbearance actually when these companies are, you know, briefly have problems, uh, Celsius, but also Babel, uh, both of which later uh, blew up. So I think in a way, like everyone learned the wrong lesson from that kind of moral hazard situation. I think that tends, when these kind of things that tends to happen where there needs to be first like a learning of the wrong lesson and then later on a paying for that lesson. Uh, so that's kind of what happened. Same thing with Luna, right? Like Luna like repegged when it was small and then it just like became much worse because people thought it was going to repeg given the first time that it would be a repeg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think that like, um, I think I think smart people are generally aware that, you know, Genesis never would have grown if it had not ta- done such loans. So there's no world where like they were conservative and then they should have like did, done this or did this, that. Like they very much knew all along that this was the game, right? Like, this was their game to like when, when you lend billions of your client deposits to F, against FTT, you know that that's the risk that's on the that's on the books, right? Like that's uh, especially in the early days when it was not even that big. So I think that you know, like I had that tweet right afterward to where I said, you know, actually one of the biggest victims of these kind of big flywheel, you know, wizards is that the companies that try to do things normally, like if you're just like a normal bar lender, let's say, you know, you, how are you going to get any market share? How are you going to get any 
growth, right? Because you got guys, meanwhile, that are going to lend toward fresh tokens that are just created. I guess, I guess there's always a moral hazard, but I feel like I would be doing our audience a disservice if I don't at least ask about the potential super cycle. Uh, so do you still believe in the super cycle? Um, or do you think that you know, crypto is going to do have these boom and bust cycles? I think actually it's it's still in a super cycle. I mean, if you even look at the way that it bounced back so quickly, like I think the three years bottom was the ETH bottom in dollars and the FTX bottom was actually ETH was still higher. Uh, it, it was more of like a Solana capitulation in that bottom. Um, but now we're, you know, we're back in reversion to the mean. Uh, it has followed the four year cycles by the same time, like the underlying trends are really strong. The the last bear market was more brutal in some ways than people thought, but it's also much less brutal, right? You know, despite all the things that happened, you know, regulatory clarity, you know, most companies that fought SEC actually won. Uh, you know, Coinbase had some good victories. Uh, Ripple had some victories. So, you know, it's actually, if you look at the regulatory landscape for um, crypto, it's it's cleaner than before. You know, you've got more ETFs, you've got, you know, and, and the US is a big leader in that space. Once you have that, you know, you're going to have Hong Kong ETFs, you're going to have every country's going to have ETFs. So I think history is long, right? Maybe when you zoom out 100 years, people will be like the super cycle of 2009 to 2035 or something. And then they'll be like, that was like, but if you zoom in really deep, they're like, no, here it died. And then here, it, you know, so. We can look at, uh, you know, like the Eric Wall has like the rainbow chart. So like we're back in the rainbow. <laughs> so it's kind of what you said, like you can zoom in and just be like, oh, like, you know, look, look at that crash in 22. But yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think, I think we're still there. I mean, crypto has been so forgiving. If, if you've just, I mean, you can't, if you just stay in this space, everyone's done well. It's, it's shocking to me seeing people that, you know, I know that are from 2020, everyone's done so well. It's, it's really amazing. You know, what, what I mean, some older people nowadays, they'll tell me something like, yeah, I'm pretty bullish crypto the next two decades on like a midterm basis. And that's the way that, I mean, they're not making a joke. They literally think in decades and they're like, yeah, I'm bullish for two decades. I don't know what happens after that, but and, and and so I think that like the boomers are all here, I feel in crypto, they're all watching it every day. And, and I think that, you know, for some it's a digital gold element and for some it's like a, you know, it's the new game in town. I think one thing, especially interesting too, is like, you're like, you're seeing, you know, with the China big tech crackdown and like, you know, you can't do as much, you know, innovation, a lot of entrepreneurs, they want to find ways to do stuff anyway. So, you know, that, that'll drive activity. Um, I think crypto is a solid ground for entrepreneurs to to raise capital on chain, but also to find users quickly and also to deploy uh, ideas quickly. So I think last few years, it's still mainly financialized, but I think that I do think we'll see broader and broader use cases come. I think I think that um, what has been needed is for that foundation of infrastructure to be built. I think that now it's pretty it's pretty built. Uh, you know, it can always be better, but you know, you you can probably do stuff, right? You you can properly just come up with an idea and just do it. So, I mean, the bull case is like there is available capital sourced globally, and like talented founders are going to use crypto as a means to generate their vision. And I've seen so many companies that like during the bull, the bear market, like they couldn't go to VCs and properly like raise cash. They issue a token, they tell people their idea on you know online, and then people are like, pe some people around the world are like, yeah, like I. I want to back you on this. And then they, you know, they, they build businesses around it. So that's, that's something that will keep like the talent flow going. Um, and, and that's definitely a bull case. So, so super cycle continues and also the super cycle in uh, Singapore prisons of, of the population of uh, <laughs> those going up as well, up only. Let's wrap up guys. Let's, let, let's do a little pasta of the week. Um, we've seen a lot of these like AI. <laughs> Every time I look at it, it's just absurd. You know, like there's all these like, um, this is from Gemini. This is the, the Google A, a chat GPT equivalent, the LLM. And it's so politically correct. That there's just been like way too much San Francisco uh, kind of sprinkled dust being put into it. You can't get them to like show a white, white person. You know, you ask them about like, <laughs> show, me, show me like the, the president in 1940. And it shows you like some, you know, Asian Pacific, like <laughs> non-binary, like whatever. So this <laughs> meme is basically like, hey, can you generate a picture of vanilla pudding? <laughs> and it says, here you go. Here's vanilla pudding. And there's just like all these pictures of chocolate pudding. <laughs> so I thought this was funny. I uh, uh, I sent this to Demis and he, he, he did not think it was funny. So uh, You know, I saw something funny on Twitter. I saw someone 
make a comment like how much brand equity was destroyed from Google for this charade. And then I was thinking about it first. My first thought was like, oh, Google's toast. They lost AI. But then I was thinking about it. I was like, this is just a small little autistic corner of crypto Twitter. Like no one in the real world. No one cares. Stuff. No one cares. The firepower is still there, right? Like the firepower is going to what's going to like matter in the end in, in that like AI war. I can go next. I have a I have a strong contender. I'm excited about to hear Sue's thoughts on this. So this is um, from Meltem here. She said, uh, my friends, why are you her, telling her? Why are you so upset? Crypto is ripping. And she's just there crying. And this meme of uh, this guy, you know, you see all these narratives, BRC 20s, SUI, farms, AI coins, decentralized physical infrastructure. Community is e-beggar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, e Paralyzed EVM, intense. It's like, restaking there are so many narratives and things to keep track of it's it's overwhelming right like it, it didn't used to be like this you could just farm sushi and chill now there are all of these things that you have to stay on top of and if you're missing just one of these the fomo is unbearable right like i miss i've missed so many airdrops taiki has been rubbing it in my face and i'm just coping out here <laughs> amazing this is this is this is top it's, it's a good one yeah it's the markets change all the time and I think, you know, there was like the Uncommon Core podcast uh, where Sue talked about financial populism, I guess. And I think airdrop farming is in a way that similar idea where we have these rich whales complain about linear distribution points mechanisms. And then we have the smaller fish talking about, well, like, you know, like, fuck those guys. Give me give me all the tokens. Um, and I think that's kind of what's playing out in crypto as well. I think the right distribution is like, a, a, a bit above zero for like the kind of like very very low amount and then it should go linear after that that's my it's my personal belief about you know you, you kind of like hit the two extremes and then you know the guys in the middle usually are, are mid curving anyway <laughs> yeah 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 but the, i mean the, the problem with linear though is that you often get like whales will own like all of it right because the sum of whales like the top 100 will own 95 percent of the supply and some bad ones like think about DeFi summer bdp something like that you get farmed by like justin sun and then it's dead well he just put 500 million or something dollars worth of eth into eigenlayer and i was thinking well this just totally ruins the points distribution now they're gonna have to do it in buckets like over 100k points is this amount of tokens 50 to 100k is this amount of tokens etc so it'll be like a final one like justin sun like af after like all the different yeah. tiers <laughs> yeah it's yeah. like ten dollars <laughs> What do you have, Taiki? I thought I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, it's like the different types of fund managers and like I guess traders in general. We have you know the value investing people who think they're super smart, but you know they're crying inside. Uh, we have like the energy cowboys, the st statistical arbitrage, like the neckbeards, uh, the tail risk hedging that's always getting wrecked, like paying for premiums, and then the venture capitals like just circle jerking and sucking its own dick. Like, like who, who 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 do you like? Like for me, I I identify with the value investing guy right the mid curve and I'm, I'm the ultimate mid curve like who do you like what do you three identify as like from this who none of them well for me it's got to be vc i like i i've said before my little barbell strategy is basically eth only and then a ton of angel investments and then not much like long tail liquid coins in the middle uh so i'm taking the bottom right there vc i guess i'm, I'm kind of like the activist i got i got the little like you know thing going on you know, I, I don't have the glasses, but I do like to be active and, and get my, you know, be in the arena. I, I kind of like make fun of myself, but I like to be in the arena. So I guess that's me. I, Jordy, I kind of think of you as the, the short seller. He's a short seller. Because remember when you called for the UST collapse, right? You were early to that. <laughs> and it went up for so long and so much. And I just could, I just picture you there just depressed. And then finally when it collapsed, just eu euphoria. Yeah. Oh, oh you Sue. Hard to say. Maybe, maybe energy. I think. I don't know what it means, energy. but I like that. So, <laughs> smoking. That sounds about right. Any uh, any pasta on your side, Sue? Oh wow! This is this is like the this is the new big thing right now. This. <laughs> I absolutely love this. I was just telling you the other day. Like, he's got to hold a conference in Bangkok called White City. If he does, I'll keynote it for sure. I'll I'll fly in for that. I think it's like he has such a strong brand. I hope he uses it in the cycle because because I think that like like my story was was obviously like you know the the, the well known one but like he's like such a legend in the that he was such a good developer as well like with lead code 
and then just like entered into like the Y city and then it's like boom like huge number two pnr ftx so i just think like the lore i think there's a lot of potential for lore sometimes it's like a, it's a non-duality where, where like very bad things can actually be very good very good things are often actually very bad so you know hope he does it yeah and for those that don't know his story i mean i i just remember during i think early 2021 where like he was just posting seven figure pnls every single day and then I think he got liquidated at some point, and then he the next image he posted was like him in a hospital for like whatever reason. Uh, I just like remember that so much. It's legendary. Yeah, I mean, uh, people maybe don't know all the all the stories from the old cycle. Uh, Sue, you were saying in the in the pre show that you know you, you go to meetups and people don't even know who what Three Arrows is. You know, there's just like yeah. so many different corners. Oh, and, and even like during the bull market, I remember, uh, I mean, when I've talked about this before, but we were in uh, Bahamas for the FTX conference and like there was some like marketing girl sitting next to you at the table and she had no idea who you were or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Crypto is just so big. It's so big. Uh, like what I found is that in Dubai, I'll get recognized, but it's usually some Indian teenagers and I'll be like, whoa. And then uh, it's almost every other day. Uh, but in other cities, it's almost never. Uh, and at crypto events, I think from what I've seen, Dubai has the most crypto savvy, maybe it's just because our brand was also quite well known in Dubai and, and Dubai is more of like, like that kind of a culture was like, who's this, who's that? But like, yeah, in, in other places, like people really will like shake, like I'll shake their hand. I'll be like, yeah, like three arrows. And they'll be like, oh, okay, cool. Um, and then they'll just say what they're from and they'll be like, okay, yeah. It's like, they won't even, it won't even register anything. Uh, just kind of glaze over. I, I I find that really really cool actually. Um, like it must be what Milken felt like, you know, five years later. Like Milken's like, yeah, Drexel, and then the, the guy will glaze over. He's like, I'm from you know Deloitte, you know, and just go straight into it. Yeah, the cycles just like keep refreshing with uh, new new entrants and new characters and different different bubbles. Because you think about it, like who do you know from you know who do people know from the 2016 cycle? Or like the 2017 stuff, it's it becomes just like a memory, right? So I think, yeah, the the speed that crypto moves at is incredible. I guess there's like a main character cycle too. Like every cycle has like its own personality that just becomes the guy. We'll see who that is this cycle. Well, I think all the all the meme kind of meme or, or uh, pasta of the weeks were, were pretty strong. So we're gonna have to like leave the chat to uh, choose a winner this time. I, I don't think we can let you win it, Justin, even though yours was very strong. I think I had the the best one there. I was waiting for Sue to Sue to crown me, but maybe, maybe. I guess we'll leave it up to the audience. We'll leave it up to the audience. Um, cool. It's been it's been uh, you know a great conversation, Sue. Thanks for hopping on. Any any final thoughts? Like, uh, I mean, thanks for having me. I mean, this is a great podcast. It's one of the main ones that I listen to nowadays. I, I think that uh, I think you guys are doing a great job uh, at kind of presenting ideas in a funny way. I think it's, uh, it's good. Yeah. Or, or, uh, you know, we're happy to explore all, all, all coins, all corners, and then we have fun with it. So, uh, thanks, thanks for hopping on and everybody will, we'll see you next week. Take care. Hi everyone.